My number one reason why I film and edit my doll creations is to help educate others who are interested in the doll customization hobby. I mean, I started my journey by learning from others, and I feel like this is my way of being able to give back for the gifts they have given to me. To this end, I've decided to add a supplemental series to my channel to go into further detail about some of the topics I discuss in my main series videos. <laughs> I hope you like them. Okay, are you ready to make your doll skin look more realistic? <laughs> Let's jump in. During my process video for Moraine, I discussed the theory of subdermal color zones. I recently had watched a video by Middle Rabbit Doll Art Studio where they implemented subdermal color zones on a doll they were working on. I mean, during my years of art study, this concept was really never discussed. However, she does an excellent job of quickly explaining it. I'll link that video and their channel below. Armed with this knowledge, I decided to hunt for more information, which there seems to be quite a lack of, but I did find plenty of examples of this in practice. And ever since then, I've been looking closely at the different color zones of people's faces and how I might be able to implement this technique with my doll art. I should mention that I am not an expert at this topic or of art in general. So if I get some of this information incorrect, I apologize. However, I think I get the main points of this technique. Okay, so dermal means skin and sub means below or under. So subdermal means located or placed beneath the skin. Okay, that's an easy definition. Color zone is where one color influences all of the colors in that area, or otherwise known as color dominance. Wow, that's a little harder to explain. Let's start at the beginning. Pure white light or sunlight contain light wavelengths for all the possible colors we see with our eyes. Without light, there's no color. It's easy for us to see this process if we place a prism in a beam of sunlight. The prism makes all of the colors bounce around inside and separates the wavelengths into single spectrums or colors. This is what we see when we notice a rainbow in the sky. However, when we look at an object that contains color, what we're actually seeing are the wavelengths that are reflected off of the object and into our eyes. All of the other waves are absorbed by the object. That sounds kind of demonic, doesn't it? I will absorb your color. <clears throat> <laughs> anyway, so white reflects all colors and black absorbs all colors. Huh. Is that why white is seen as pure and black is seen as evil? Okay, okay, stay with me. I promise there's a reason for all of this. As kids, we learn about primary colors. Or perhaps it was from OK Go, I don't know, I guess it depends on how old you are. <coughs> anyway, <laughs> we know that primary colors mixed together make what are known as secondary colors. Yellow and red make orange. Red and, yellow make orange. Red and blue make purple. Red make purple. Blue and red make purple. Yellow and blue make green. There's also these tertiary colors, but we don't really need to go into that now. These six primary and secondary colors are often described as being hues, or the pure form of what we see the color as. When someone asks you to describe a color, we often say it's red-ish or blue-ish or green-ish. <laughs> that ish part is what makes up the gradation of tints and shades of a particular hue. The color could be a light lavender, but it's still part of the purple family, or hue. Now, the way we get light lavender is by taking the pure pigment of a hue and adding white to it. This is what's called a tint. This makes the color less saturated because white is dispersing the color that our eyes see. 
So our eyes see this as a lighter color. In the exact opposite, we can make a dark purple by adding black to it. This is called a shade. The black absorbs more of the color, so our eyes see less of it, which is why we see the hue as being darker. Keep tints and shades in mind when you're coloring your dolls, because the shadows or highlights you want to create should be made with tints or shades of your doll's base color. I'll discuss this in more depth later on. Patience, patience, I'm getting to it. <laughs> okay, before we talk about what's under the skin, we need to talk about what's in the skin. I should start by saying that much of what I'm going to discuss is going to be what these colors look like through pale tinted skin, mostly because it's easiest to see these differences in pale skin tones. But all of these rules apply for darker pigment as well. Within the epidermis or upper layers of our skin lays the cells that produce melanin. Now, melanin is a broad term for the chemicals our bodies produce to give our skin, eyes, and hair color. <laughs> it's main use to help protect our bodies from UV radiation. While everyone, regardless of ethnicity, has the same amount of melanin producing cells, it's the production rate, size, and type of melanin that gives humans a variety of skin and hair colors. Everyone's skin tone is different, and I think that's pretty rad. There's also a type of melanin that darkens when exposed to UV radiation. That's why some of us tan. Not me, of course. No, I sunburn, then fade back to ghost white. <laughs> This is also the melanin that creates moles or freckles. Remember when I discussed hues, tints, and shades? Well, this is one of those places you can apply that knowledge. It's been discovered that tans, freckles, and moles take the base skin color, oh, we'll discuss that in a bit, and shifts the hue toward an orangish yellow. Then, depending on the amount of melanin production and sun exposure, the color darkens to a different shade. Essentially, black is added to the color to make the hue darker. A way to implement this into your doll work is to mix together a color that is similar to your doll's skin hue. Then add a small bit of orange and a little bit of yellow. Then slowly add in black until you've reached a color that you're happy with. This will produce a more natural looking freckle or beauty mark that's complementary to your doll's skin tone. Well, I can't discuss any of this without first talking about blood. Yes, yes, dolls don't have blood, but stick with me here. Our skin color is also based on the blood running through our veins. Do me a favor. Find a place on the palm of your hand that looks particularly colorful. For me, I feel like the pad of my palm at the base of my thumb is best for me, but you make the decision that's best for you. With your other hand, Press firmly on the area for a few seconds. What you are doing is temporarily stopping blood flow to that area. Now stop pressing and look at the color that appears. That is your base skin color without blood flow affecting what we see. The oxygen carrying protein hemoglobin travels through our bloodstream and is responsible for the reddish color we see in lighter skin tones. The red is a more intense color than the melanin colors, so that's why it shows through. If you have a darker complexion, this might be more difficult to see, but it's still very much present. It's speculated that because the blood vessels are located in the lower dermal layers of the skin, that the color of the melanin in the top dermal layers mask more of the red, but it is still present. This is why it's easier to see a flushed face with a lighter skin tone over a darker one. But that doesn't mean that those people don't flush and have their pigment change. It's just not as obvious. It's important to note that we often see veins that have a blue hue. These are veins that are returning deoxygenated blood back to the heart and lungs. The blood is not actually blue, but it's simply a darker shade of red that can be seen to look like blue. There's a whole speculation thing about perceived color in relation to the colors around it, but it's not really necessary for this particular topic. 
So all of this is to say that the base hue is the color lacking in both melanin and blood flow. Of course, with a doll, there's no way of knowing what the base color is, since we're not able to do a test with plastic or vinyl. But it's a good thing to keep in mind while you're shading or picking colors for shadows and highlights. Okay, okay, you're right. Let's get into it. So we now know that skin pigment is affected by both the amount of melanin in the upper layers of our skin and the amount of blood vessels under our skin, correct? Well, let's put that together in regards to faces. Everyone's faces are made up of basically three color zones. These are the colors that lay underneath the skin and affect the way our eyes interpret the pigment there. Let's look at these pictures of the muscles and veins underneath the skin. The top of the head and forehead have a little bit of muscle and very few capillaries. But the skin is also thinner here, so we're not gonna see a lot of red. It'll most likely be closer to our base skin hue, which can often look yellow or white for lighter pigmented folks. The next zone is the cheeks and nose. This area is very fleshy with thicker skin and several main veins running through it, which is why these areas look more rosy than other places on the face. Lastly, the mouth, chin, and jaw. This area has fewer veins and is still pretty fleshy. However, this area also contains hair follicles. Of course, female hair follicles tend to be a little thinner, which makes it less noticeable than our male counterparts. The melanin in the hair color mixed with the yellow of the skin creates a wide variety of colors for people often this tends toward a blue-green hue. If the doll you're making happens to be male, you can accentuate this feature and give them a deeper shadow and accentuate the stronger jaw. Is anything ever that simple? Of course not. There are always exceptions and deeper details. For example, under the eyes. Depending on the age of the character you're recreating, there can often be a darkness or a blue tone there because the skin thins in that area as we age, so we're able to see the darker capillaries through the skin better there. The bridge of the nose has almost no veins and the skin is very thin here. This will look more yellow or white or closer to the base skin tone. Lips have a lot of blood flow to them in order to help us use our mouths to articulate words. Use our mouths to articulate words. They are also an area of thicker skin, so this usually shows as a more red hue. However, the corners of the mouth have less blood and thinned skin, and can tend more towards the base skin tone. Center of our cheeks. This gets a little tricky. <laughs> We've discussed that the cheeks have a lot of blood flow, but we've also discussed that sun exposure can cause melanin to produce an orangish yellow shade of our base skin tone. Our cheeks, especially with people who freckle, tend to catch a lot of sun and can change color more quickly. Think of how often you might end up with a sunglasses sunburn or tan on your cheeks. In this case, the subdermal coloring might tend toward a more orangish yellow. Where else in the face could the subdermal color be affected? If you have some suggestions, let me know in the comments. Really, the answer to that depends on your own personal techniques. With my most recent doll, Moraine, I painted sub layers of the color zones and then did a light coating of my chosen skin tone on top. This effectively made the skin look more realistic and gave it more depth. A similar thing could be done with chalk pastels. You could add the subdermal colors and then cover it with a skin toned pastel. However, my suggestion with chalk pastels is to keep these theories in mind while you're adding color to the face. If you're adding some highlights to the forehead, perhaps choose or mix the color with more of a yellow or white base. Try to steer clear of whites that push closer to the blue side of the spectrum though, because these are not going to help you. Instead of choosing a bright pink or red for the cheeks, perhaps think about introducing a little bit of yellow. That way you get that orangish yellow tone. This can be used for adding contouring as well. The contour shadows you create shouldn't be black. 
They should be the base skin color, plus a bit of red, plus the orangish yellow mixed with black to create the shade and depth of color you're looking for. The amount of red depends on where you're putting the shadow, of course. But with all of these, remember that the base color is the skin color minus red. You won't be able to find that on a doll, but I bet you can probably figure out a close approximation. Well, I hope this was useful and not too much information. I ended up giving you a half a semester of art school and a quarter of a semester of biology in this video. <laughs> Let me tell you, trying to boil it all down into easy to swallow bites was a difficult task. Anyway, please let me know what you think and if you have any other questions. As I said, I'm not an expert in any of this and have probably made a few mistakes, but I think the basic details are correct. And I'll be back with another doll progress video at the beginning of May, so keep an eye out for that. Thank you so much for watching and I hope you had a sweet time. <laughs>